Well, welcome everybody. I see we're gonna admit a few more people in from the waiting room and I'll, I'm sure people will trickle in as well as we get started. Well, hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And I'm happy to welcome you to today's program called Postcards to a Little Boy, a Kinder Transport Story. As you know, Yom HaShoah is later this week and I'm proud that we are coming together as a community to commemorate the Holocaust and hear from a survivor and from a JFN member that works to ensure that we are able to remember and keep, keep, the, um, keep it alive. Today, we start by hearing from JFM member Marty Hershkowitz, founder of Creating Memory, a free art-based initiative for Holocaust education that uses the creative arts and exploration of relatable themes to connect students to the Holocaust in new ways. We will also have the honor to hear from Henry Foner, who, had, who at only six years old, when he left Germany without his family to escape the terror of the Nazis, he was one of 10,000 Jewish children who were rescued on the kinder transfer program, um, which sends children to live in safety. Henry's father sent him colorful postcards. The postcards were later featured in a book published by Yad Vashem um, Publications called Postcards to a Little Boy, a Kinder Transport Story. And he'll tell us a lot more about that. And Henry is going to be joined by his daughter and my colleague, Maya Foner, Director of Programs at JF in Israel, who will speak with her father and be in conversation with him as he shares his story. And now I'd like to invite Marty Hirschkowitz, um, JFN member and founder of Creating Memory, to share a little bit about his work. Thank you, Marty. You're welcome. So um, I'm a second generation and my parents never spoke about the Holocaust. They it was important to them the future, not the past. And at a certain age, I felt that I needed to somehow connect to the past, but I didn't have any stories. I didn't have any way to really connect to, to the ideas, to the, uh, to the story or the narrative. And so what I did was, is I started writing poetry. And um, I, I would like to show you um, my poem, which is uh, just two, two uh, slides from now uh, that uh, show you. So could you put the slide down? This is the, when I'm talking about the silence. Now I'd like to read you a poem that I wrote about the idea that, that I needed the words my search for a narrative, ineffable. In the face of the ineffable, there can be no words, they say, only silence. But my life has been measured by decades of silence, not mere kilometers. So the crunch of the flagstones, the swirl of the winds, even the tears are no stead. Here in Auschwitz, silence will not suffice. For when words return, they return as they were, like seeds scattered on the frozen ground. But if a voice can rise from the desolation to parse therewith a syntax of the pain, then words and tomb shall resurgent flow, words whose tears may heal the soul again. So uh, a few years ago, when I decided to start the, um, my, uh, the Steinmetz Herskovitz Fund, I looked at my history as, as a second generation who used the creative process in order to connect to the, uh, to the Holocaust narrative. And I thought that this could be something that, that would be a worthwhile philanthropic uh, project to do. It's meant to connect future generations to their heritage. And a lot of the youth don't feel connected to the Holocaust. They say it's a long time ago. It's not relevant. It's, it's not emotionally meaningful to them. So the creative process where they create their own narratives makes the, the ideas are based on, on the themes of the Holocaust suddenly connects them to this. And this personal, personal involvement that they have with the emotional contact means that, that the creating memory process allows us to connect to it. And this is not something that's new to me, I would like to, to share on the screen the, the next slide, which is uh, Aaron Applefeld, who said that, that the Holocaust survivors work very hard to, to bring the stories, but the next step is the next generation, the evolution of the narrative process must, it's time to rip windows in their narrative and, and 
to create with this in order to, uh, to crumble the horrors and create a, this new narrative for the future generations. And so that's, this is my feeling as far as creating memory. And this is why I've, I've, uh, I've teamed with the uh, Lukestein Center and Barry Lan in order to bring the program also to America because it, it's, uh, we have Yotrimzi know, Karon here in Israel, in schools, in, in all sorts of uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, and uh, that, that deal with, uh, that bring plays and bring writing and all sorts of things like that, 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 that is, is causing a, a renewal of the Holocaust narrative. And I hope that uh, this will continue and it'll continue to grow because I think it's essential for the Holocaust narrative to continue with for future generations. Thank you. And uh, well, at, at the end, I'll be available for questions. Thank you so much, Marty. Um, Tamara, I'll, should I take it over? Is Perfect, it okay? thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Maya Foner. I'm the director of programs in JFN Israel, as Tamar mentioned. And I'm so excited to be here today uh, interviewing my father. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moving moment. Um, and what I wanted to ask is if as many as possible of you would be willing to, um, to show your faces on the video because um, we want to create a bit of a feeling of a living room. As you probably have heard uh, uh, some years ago, there started in Israel a, a project called Zikaron Basalon, um, memory in your living room or remembering in, in your living room, where actually uh, survivors and second generation um, of survivors started to tell the stories in a very intimate environment in your living room meet and, and hear the story. And this is what we were trying to create here today. Um, so thank you for turning your cameras on. I think also for my father who is uh, approaching 90 in June, he, he's going to be 90. Um, it's already pretty amazing to me that my parents managed to make this transition to Zoom in the times of Corona. And uh, my father was used to public speaking, but um, he did the transition to Zoom. And having, uh, having your faces there with us is, uh, is, I think, great. The other thing that you should know is that um, I am actually in their living room, or you can see the living room through there. Um, and uh, my parents are sitting in the other room. So it's, um, you know, we're kind of letting you into our house and we hope uh, that it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it feels nice and homey. So, um, um, I want to introduce my father, Dr. Henry Foner, um, and my mother who's sitting right next to him. And um, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to my dad who does this the best. He'll go through a presentation that he has, tell the story, and then um, I'll start up uh, a few questions from me and then we can jump into questions from you, which is the most important part. So um, Abba? Okay, here I am. I'm going to share the screen. I'm, I'm going to share the screen and he's going to tell me next. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for coming. And like Maya said, welcome to our house in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm not used to doing Zooms, just taking part in them. So it, it's really good that Maya is here to do the technical work and it gives us uh, a rare opportunity to see her at work, which is an added bonus. So what I want to talk to you about today is one small aspect of the Holocaust. It was called the Kinder, or it is called the Kinder Transport, the Children's Front. To tell you about me and my small part in this project. So can we have the next slide, please, Maya? I want you to think back to January 1933, when Hitler comes into power, and there's half a million, 600,000 or so Jews in Germany. 
And right after, as soon as he's in, in April, he comes in in the end of January, and in April, there's this law for the restoration of the professional civil service, which is uh, fancy talk for saying Jews can't be employed in anything to do with the civil service. And this included my father, who was a lawyer, and thus somehow, uh, covered by this law. So my father, who was in private practice, lost his job and he became a legal advisor, so-called, to the Jewish Community Council. And as we'll get back to it later, in 1935 came the Nuremberg race laws. And in the December 1938 came Kristallnacht. So what I'm trying to show you in this slide is that over the years, gradually things became worse and worse and worse. When Kristallnacht came, can we have the next slide, man, please? It was um, a government organized pogrom. On this, uh, this night, they, they smashed up Jewish shops. They burned synagogues. A few hundred people, nobody knows how many were killed. 30,000 Jewish men were uh, put into concentration camps. Some were killed there, some were tortured there. Most of them were eventually released. But the point I want to make is that at this point, those Jews who uh, were left in Germany realized that um, this was no passing episode and that Hitler was here to stay and they should uh, try to get out as many people as they can. Can we have the next slide, please? So there were various attempts to save Jews. And one of these attempts was a plan put forward by the Jewish agency in British mandated Palestine to uh, take 10,000 uh, Jewish children uh, sorry, to 10,000 Jews to Palestine. This uh, plan met with a lot of opposition. It met, the Arabs didn't like it. The colonial office didn't like it. The foreign office didn't like it uh, because they were wanted Arab oil for the British uh, Navy. And they wanted uh, undisputed passage through the Suez Canal to India. So it was eventually uh, watered down uh, into a proposal to temporarily bring 10,000 Jewish children up to the age of 17 to the United Kingdom for two years maximum until they could be uh, moved out of the United Kingdom. So here we see the details of, of the kinder transport. The last train left on the 1st of September, 1939, which uh, was the day war broke out. Uh, the children had no passports. And, and here's the thing, the British government let 10,000 children in, but they were not uh, willing to, let the, to pay anything for the privilege. So everybody, uh, every child had to have a guarantee of 50 pounds cash, which is about $3,000 of today's money, uh, to make sure that he could be shipped out, not on the public purse. Okay, Maya. And so who organized this? There were Jewish organizations in Germany and in the UK, various Christian sects with various uh, aims in view, including uh, converting to Christianity, and the Society of Friends who played, the Quakers, who played a, a very important and ethical uh, role in this uh, project by persuading the British government, and we'll talk about it, to allow the Kinder Transport project to take place. Uh, then there were individuals, and we'll talk about two, and of course, the people and the institutions who uh, took the children in. Okay, Maya. And I said individuals, and I want to just talk about two of them. 
And I want to talk about them because it does show that even when things are happening in the world scale and, and he, between countries, sometimes individuals can make a huge difference. And one of these individuals was a man called Wilfred Israel. He's not very well known. There's a, a newish film about him made in Israel, a documentary, and there's a book written by Naomi Shepard about him. But he was a very unusual person. Uh, Wilfred Israel was um, son of uh, a woman, Mrs. Adler, who was a Miss Adler. And Miss Adler married a German businessman, his father, who owned this immense uh, uh, what do you, a department store. It was the biggest department store in Germany by far. You can see it was huge, stood right opposite the town hall in Berlin. And anybody who, everybody who was anybody had an account there. Now, the thing that was important in this case is that uh, Bess Adler, uh, who this is uh, Israel, uh, was the daughter of the chief rabbi of the British Empire. She took care that all her children although she lived in Germany, would be born in Great Britain. So her children were all British subjects. So they were British subjects. He was a British subject. He was a very wealthy man. He was a very unusual man. And he uh, and his Quaker friends, he was friends with people like uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he was friends with Albert Einstein. And he collected a far uh, Eastern art. Uh, he was an amazing person, and he devoted himself to getting people out from the Nazi. He more or less ran through his fortune, getting his own employees from this uh, store out of Germany. He was later on killed in a, an unfortunate um, air, uh, not accident. He was shot down, but he was flying from Portugal to England. And the plane was shot down uh, together with the famous um, film star, Leslie Howard, was Leslie it? Howard. Leslie Howard. And the thought is that they thought that th there was a double of Winston Churchill on this plane. Don't know if it's true. Anyway, he was shot down and killed. And the other person I want to talk about uh, briefly is this man, Nicholas Winton. Nicholas Winton. Uh, was a straw rotor, non-Jewish, although his background had been, his parents had been Jewish. And he worked in London, and he had a friend who was in Czechoslovakia and saw what was happening to the Jews in the Sudetenland and in Czechoslovakia in 1938. And this friend invited him to come and see, him. and he was so uh, horrified and impressed by what he saw was happening that he single-handedly decided to save as many children as he could and bring them into the United Kingdom. And he was able to do this because of this law that had been passed allowing 10,000 Jewish children into the United Kingdom. And so under that umbrella, he worked and he found uh, homes and places to live for 600 and something children. The last train with 250 children was in the station in Prague on September the 1st, which is when war broke out. And uh, it never left, and those children were probably mostly killed. The really unusual thing, I think, um, is that Nicholas Winton never told anybody what he did. He put all the papers, the war broke out, he put the papers in the attic and he went off and he served as an officer in the Royal Air Force. Fifty years later, his wife went into the attic and found all these filing cabinets full of papers and with addresses and names and asked what it was and he told her and it became known and he got knighted by the Queen and he got all sorts of medals from Czechoslovakia and so on. Um, but he did this in the, in the true spirit of, uh, it was not exactly philanthropy, I don't know what the word is, 
but he did it and he didn't want any credit. It didn't look for any credit for it. So now I want to slightly show you where I come into this. Uh, I was born not Henry Fona, I was born Heinz Lischwitz. Here you see my, my grand must have been around the time they got married. Look at her waist, ladies, and must be a corset, wasn't it? Um, look at this moustache. Uh, okay, Maya. Uh, they lived in Berlin, and the family business was a large printing works, a hundred something. Uh, because I will show this to people because that's how they printed things in those days with hot lead, uh, not like today with a with a computer. Okay. And this is where they live. This is the house in 30 Kantstrasse. It's still there. You'll see other photos of it soon. This is straight after the war when it was uh, had been ruined by bombing and shelling. Okay, Maya. This is how it looks now. I think it's about 30, 40 apartments in this building. Now, my grandparents had uh, three children. Can we see them? And the next one, do you think? Yeah, here they are from left to right Ludwig, Walter, and on the right with Jane, that's my father, Max. And each, uh, they all lived in that building. They got married, had a, an apartment in that factory. And so there were four apartments there belonging to the Lischwitz family. Okay. My family in Germany, the Lischwitzes, was that they thought they were German. And you can see here, and in the next slide, it's all in German, so you just have to believe me. But this is the document giving them citizenship of Prussia. In 1812, there was an edict of, of Frederick the Great, the Emperor of Prussia, giving uh, the franchise to Jews and giving them full rights, except to be civil servants, I think, and army officers. Um, apart from that, they, had, they were full citizens and had to pay taxes and had all the rights. So <coughs> the Lichwitz family, like many other Germans, thought they were more German than the Germans. After all, they'd been Prussians before there was a Germany even in existence, because Germany was only created in 1840 something. Uh, well, Hitler showed them wrong. Okay, Maya. Uh, in 1932, just before uh, Hitler came into power, my father and mother had this bonny baby who turned into to me. Uh, here you see my father and my mother. Okay. Here is a picture of a German middle-class family living room in the Yad Vashem Museum. I don't know how many of you have been there, but uh, if you go there, you can see there's that typewriter. That was my father's typewriter. Uh, it's as good as the day it was made, and I typed my master's thesis on it. Okay, Maya. I think the next slide is that. It's an Erica. Next slide. Also, it's it's set up like a family room, and there are the family pictures and the nice, kind people in uh, Yad Vashem put my family photos in as the family photos on the on the sideboard. As nobody knows this except the people in Yad Vashem, you, and us. So it's a secret. And also there is a, uh, a train clockwork, which my father sent me and which uh, my, even my grandchildren played with. I just should say in uh, parenthesis that my father managed to send a lift, which is like a container of uh, furniture and belongings, supposedly my mother's. He managed to send it to me 
after I left Germany. And here's the corner in the Yad Vashem Museum devoted to the kinder transport. Um, I happen to be the representative they chose, or whose story they chose to illustrate the kinder transport. Uh, okay. Well, this is me as I was six and a half years old or something like that in Germany with satchel on my back and my sandwich bag on my front. Maya used to play with that sandwich bag when she was little. Maya and the survived my translation to here. Uh, okay. Here you see little Heinz Lischwitz in Berlin, six and three, three quarter year old on the day that he left Berlin. Abschied means farewell. And here's the journey that I made from Berlin to the Hook of Holland, to Harwich, to port in the east coast of England, to London, and then out of England into Wales, uh, into a town called Swansea. And here you see um, the documents we had instead of a passport. We each had a label around our necks. Can we go on there? Oh, here you see, whoops. That's the label. No, go back a bit. That's, that's it. So that's, that's the label. The label. That, that's, the label. that's the labels. You, you can see them here. Oops, forward. You can see these uh, older children thought it was a great adventure um, getting to England. Uh, next slide, I think you can see what happened when they got off the play, the gangplank. Uh, there you see the Bobby at the bottom of the gangplank checking out. He checked out these labels. Now, I can remember this journey very well. It wasn't, um, it wasn't. For me, anyway, a very happy uh, occasion because uh, I was torn from my family. I can't remember the details of the parting, although I do remember the journey very well. We got onto the train at Friedrichstrasse, and it was that old-fashioned sort of train. I don't know if they still have them, with a corridor down one side and compartments all along the length of it. And I was in a, in a compartment with other young people. I can't remember them. I was only six. Uh, there were people who looked afterwards, uh, looked after us, young people, 18, 20. I can't remember them. I just know from reading. And incidentally, those people had to return to Germany and their families were held as hostage uh, to make sure they returned. Um, after some hours, when we got to the, no, go back a bit, man. When we got to uh, the Dutch border, the train stopped, and then uh, the doors flung open, and people in uniform came in and screamed and shouted us at us and searched us physically and looked in our, the one little suitcase we had looking for valuables, because you're only allowed to take, I think, 10 Reichmark out of Germany at the time. They took uh, all sorts of uh, jewelry from the girls. I know that from talking to people. That was a really frightening experience. And the doors shut closed. The train went on a few hundred meters. The doors opened again. And we were in a different world, because there were stout, jolly, women in white uniforms with white hats, dishing out, uh, uh, not hamburg, well, hot, 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 hot dogs, hot dogs with mustard. I remember the mustard and cold drinks. And all the children were now 90 or something. Uh, they remember those hot dogs and those nice Dutch women. The train went on, we went to the Hook of Holland, we got on the ferry. It must have been overnight, although I can't remember it. And then we got off at Harwich, and you saw those people. I remember the policeman very well. We got on a cross the tracks, 
we got on a train that went to a Liverpool street station. Okay, my. Uh, we were collected in a in a big hall of children, and not anybody really understanding what was happening because none of us spoke. English. There must have been 20, 30 of us. Nobody spoke English, and nobody there, or very few people there, presumably somebody must have spoken German. Uh, anyway, we were eventually uh, the hall more or less emptied out, and then came a lady. Selina Levy, her name was, from Swansea, and collected us. And we went on a train from Paddington, to, and it eventually after five hours or so, it got to Swansea, which is in Wales. And they, we were delivered to uh, the people who had uh, offered to take us. And I was delivered to this uh, couple who were, uh, she was in her early 40s, he was in his early 50s. They were called Morris and Wendy Fona, and they became my new parents, although they never pretended even to be my real parents. And I called them uncle and auntie because, because that's what they wanted. Um, and I began my new life. Uh, Just uh, to interject, did you know that you were going specifically to the Foners? No, quite. The, uh, yes, I did, actually. But it's, it's a funny story because it, it was changed when my father told me in late 1938 that I was going to go to England and he would try to join me uh, later on, or that he would join me later on. Uh, he asked me to pray for the welfare of the people that I was going to go to, which I did every night. And then sometime later, he came to me and explained that the plans had changed and I wasn't I can't remember their name, but I was now going to go to a Mr. and Mrs. Fauna. So he asked me if I would be good enough to change the direction of the prayers towards Horace and Winnie Fauna, which I did. And I hope the people who didn't get my prayers weren't all offended because of it. Uh, so I knew I was going there, but there was no, um, there was no contact between the families. They didn't know each other. I don't know how it was arranged that I should go to the Foners, but I struck very, very lucky because they were Jewish and um, they were childless, uh, although they brought up all sorts of unfortunate children in both their families. And uh, they treated me as they would have treated their own child for better and for Can't ask more people than that. And because of them, I'm alive. And so are you, Maya. Right. Um, and this is a photo they had taken, photo they had taken uh, commercially to send to my father. My mother was already dead by this time. Okay. Well, I was the only son of Max and uh, the only grandson and the only nephew. And so my family sent us uh, sent me postcards all the time. This is the first postcard on the 3rd of February, 1939, which was the day I landed, the day after I left uh, Berlin. Um, there were pictures of, you know, suitable for a little boy. What, what I want you, can you just go back a minute, Maya, one? Stamps. The stamps of uh, Hindenburg, I think. There's no swastika on them. It's the strangest thing. Nobody's explained to me how come the postage stamps in Germany, uh, what, uh, seven years or after, or six years after Hitler came into power, everything had swastikas on it, but not the postage stamps. Very interesting. Hmm. Okay. So these were postcards to a little boy, to a little boy, little teddy bears with uh, small messages in in print. Okay. This um, could barely read. So this, this is a nice train. Somebody sent me. Okay. And this is the last postcard because 
On the 1st of September, which is when war broke out in Europe, it broke out between Britain and Germany on the 3rd of September, uh, there was no post because there's no post between countries at war. So this is the front of the last one. If we look at the back of the last postcard, it says, I hope war will not come. If he is coming, although, God bless you and uncle and auntie. There are two things about this postcard. First is war did come the next day. So that was my father's real last missive to me. And you can see that uh, this postcard is written in English. And there's a reason for this. It's because uh, my birthday is in June. And for my seventh birthday, my father telephoned me. He rang me up. And I'll tell you young people, this is not like uh, it is now where you just pick up your smartphone and ring your cousin in Australia and it costs 10 cents maybe. Uh, this was a big deal. And the exchange, which had ladies who were pushing in and out buttons and so on, uh, notified you about three days in advance that there was a call going to come in in Wednesday afternoon, let's say, three o'clock. Please be ready to receive it, which we were. And the telephone rang. We had a telephone at home in Swansea, the type where the earpiece was separate from the mouthpiece, and you spoke into a little stand like this. The man talked on the other end. And it was my father, but I couldn't understand a word he said, because in four months I'd completely forgotten my German. So we carried on presumably in English, although I can't really remember. Uh, and that was the last uh, contact I had with my father. Then this was the last postcard. He changed the language. Yeah, and he changed the language, of course. Uh, is that the next one, or have we skipped one now? Uh, this uh, one was, the, oh, I think this one you meant. Yeah, this one. Got out of said. The only other thing I ever heard from my father was this letter, which is a form letter from the Red Cross. And the idea is that once uh, it was all censored, of course, uh, it took two months, you can see, to get from Berlin to Swansea. Uh, one side writes 25 letters, uh, uh, words, and the other side can also write 25 words. So this is that last, this is really the last missive I got from my father. Okay, my. I'd say that at this time, uh, or right at the beginning of the war, um, the phone has decided to change my name from Heinz to Heinz. It's less German sounding and Fona, from Lischwitz to Fona because it was always difficult to say who is this little boy and uh, anyway it, it sounded a lot less German and uh, a great idea to wander around with German sounding name during the war. So. Auntie Winnie, Mrs. Fona, collected these postcards and put them in an album. And when Judy and I got married and came to live in England, which we did for some years, uh, they gave us all the things my father had sent, and they gave us also this um, album of postcards with all my father's postcards in it. Um, I decided that uh, I would like to give the Cards to Yad Vashem, but our children wanted uh, very keen on this, so I asked Yad Vashem to make scans, and I made a, a photo book like you make for your holidays nowadays. Can we see the next thing of it? Next one, there it is. Uh, it was that was the photo book, and uh, because the people in Yad Vashem were so. Uh, charming and helpful and considerate, I thought they would be interested in a copy for their library, which they were. 
And uh, shortly afterwards, they got in touch with me and said they would like me to expand this and make it into an album and could they publish it. So I said, you can publish it with pleasure and uh, I consider it a memorial to my father. I can push it uh, to sell it with a clear conscience because I don't get any royalties for it. So if anybody <laughs> wants to buy it from Yad Vashem in any of three languages, Hebrew, German, or English, it's all for Yad Vashem and I'm happy for that to happen. Um, and it's a, I'll add that it's a collection of all the postcards with the translations, as well as a background about the kinder transport and all kinds of other things that you don't have time today to elaborate. Right, right. They made a very nice job of it, I've, I've got to say. I mean, I've written lots of things in my time, but it's all scientific stuff, which is very, very boring. And if you do uh, ever come across the book, you can consider yourselves in good company because Yad Vashem have kindly asked me to present it to various important people. This on the left is David Cameron, who was uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He came to visit Bibi, but I will say he only was here for 24 hours. So he really came to see me and he saw the Prime Minister as well. Okay. <laughs> this was Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge. They arranged for me and this gentleman next to me. Uh, to have a 15 minute private chat with him. It was quite uh, an affecting occasion. Actually, both of those were both emotional occasions for me. Think of it, a little boy who comes to a country, six years old as a refugee, gets to write a book, um, and then gets to give it to the prime minister and the heir apparent to the throne years later. So it really was an emotional experience for me. Okay, my. And the latest thing is I got to give the book to Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, the present Prime Minister still. Um, the other two people, the Rav Lau and the Chairman of Yad Vashem. But that also was a, a, a nice, Meaningful occasion. Here's the head of the country that kicked me out, happy to shake hands and chat with me, which she did, and to, with Judy, uh, about eight years more or less later on, 80 something years later on. If you believe in circles, these are interesting interlocking circles. Okay, Maya, what's next? There are memorials to the kinder transport statues, and they are made by a man called Frank Meisel. And I want to talk about them for a minute or two, because some of you in your travels may see them. Frank Meisel was born in Danzig, and this is the memorial in Danzig uh, where he came. And if you see the next one, this is the memorial in Berlin. Can you see that the Little figure that they're not so little. The figures are in light colored matte bronze and darker colored bronze. The light colored ones holding the suitcase, they're going off to freedom. The dark colored ones with the suitcases on the floor, they're not going anywhere. They're actually going to their deaths, most of them. So next one, this is called the statue was called Trains to Life. Here they are. And Trains to Death. It's a very moving uh, statue. The next statue is in the Hook of Holland. We were invited to the unveiling of it. Um, here you see us with our labels, uh, waiting to go on the boat. OK. Here you see us in Liverpool Street Station, uh, living in England with our suitcases and our labels again. You go on, Maya, or was that? 
Oh, yeah, I think I'll... Okay, I'll, uh, so I think I'll stop talking at this point. Um, I can take over from there. And yes. Whenever there's questions, I, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for that. And it, it's very difficult to tell the story. It's, it's, a, it's a long story with lots of details. And um, it's difficult to get to all the details in, in such a short time that we have. And I also do want to make sure that we have time for some questions from the audience. But um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask you how it was for you. Um, you know, you were a little boy when you were sent and you had a certain experience, but how was it for you when you became a father yourself and maybe later a grandfather, when you looked back at your journey? It's a strange thing. Um, I think when I was a father myself, I was too busy dragging up you kids to think too much. But when we, Maya has a brother called David and uh, had, um, he has a little boy, he was little then, and uh, when, when that's, his name is Asaf, when Asaf was born, David came to me and he said, Abba, I don't know how your father managed to let you go. I think that was the first time I really felt in my heart what my father must have gone through. I don't think I felt it when I was a father myself, because we never had any intention of letting anybody go. But um, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to show a second, just to give an impression of the book and how, I don't know if you can see, but it's really full of, each page has like a postcard and then the translation. And then through that, you really hear the, the loving voice of, of your father who's speaking to, to a little boy with very simple content, you know, that could interest a little boy and could make contact with a little boy. And you, you really feel the, the loving and, and the missing. Um, but, but later in the book, there is, a, there is another letter that you didn't mention here where you hear um, his voice as, a, as an adult, let's say, not as just a father speaking to a little boy. So could you also say something about that, that letter? Yes, well, this is a painful subject. Uh, this is a letter that we got from a second cousin of my father who was also his best friend who managed to escape to America. I can't make this really too short, else there's no point in it. Uh, in this, this is a letter I received when I was already married and living in, in Leeds with Judy. And uh, in it, uh, is a letter from this uh, person in America saying, uh, would I please sign some papers on a small, legacy from somebody who I, I can't remember who it was a few hundred Deutsche Marks. And then he says, uh, in passing, by the way, I was your father's best friend and have his last letter to me. Would you be interested in receiving it? And so, of course, I said yes. And he sent me the letter and Judy's mother was staying with us because the letter was in German and she spoke German and she translated it. And it made such a terrible impression on me that it was 20 years or so before I could make myself read this, the translation of this letter again. Because in it, he writes to his cousin, Irvin, asks him to get in touch with his son and tells him where he is. And he asks two things of, it, of, of Irvin. He says, tell my son that I love him and I would never have let him go if I could have helped it, which I anyway knew, although it's very affecting to hear that when you're an adult and kind of things. And the other thing he said, and ask the telephone of families how much I appreciate the fact that they saved my son's life. And they were already not in a state of being able to receive this news probably. He was dead, she was not well. And it, it really broke my heart that I couldn't tell them how my father was great, in my father's own words, how grateful he was to them. 
So that's basically this other letter. We keep saying, if it ever happened in our family, I hope we'd behave differently. Yeah. Right. Um, are there any questions from the people who joined us today? I have a lot of other questions, but I want to leave some space for you guys. Um, did you write your father back? Was there any way to uh, uh, you know, communicate with back. him as well? Oh yeah, in the time of the postcards, I wrote back. They made me, the phone has made me sit down and write back to my father. <laughs> and he all the time complains that I don't write enough, which of course, you know, I was a little boy, didn't like to write letters, I wanted to go outside, play, get dirty. Uh, but um, no, no, I wrote back, but not enough. Thank you. I'm wondering if you knew as a six-year-old, you know, I, I have four kids and one of them is a six-year-old boy. So hearing your story, it, it's just so powerful and tragic. And I'm trying to keep myself from not crying through this entire Zoom, but just thank you for your heroism in, in telling us this story. Um, I'm just wondering as a six-year-old, if you, when, like at what point you realize that your father may not be joining you in England and that you might not be seeing him again. I'm just wondering how you realized that, how it was communicated to you. And if there was a point where at the beginning you thought you were just in England living with people for a little while, and then at some point you realized it was permanent and how you processed that as such a young child. What a good question. Um, there must have been a point, but I don't remember it. What, what I do remember is that every time something important happened or during my childhood, uncle and auntie would say to me, uh, don't forget you have a real family somewhere in Germany and we don't know what happened to them and we won't know until the war is over. So at some point quite early on, I realized I may or I may not have a father and a grandmother and uncles. Um, that I remember quite distinctly. But there must have been a, a point of inflection, uh, so to speak, where I, I suddenly read, but I don't remember it. There was also, you know, a war on, and Swansea was heavily bombed, so there were plenty of other distractions apart from what was happening to my family. Only after the war. Really. Yeah, but only, it, only when the war finished, uh, we, we heard what, when people came back. Actually, they, everybody came back except for my father. Do you want to say a word about what happened to um, to the rest? Yes, well, we're running short of time. Uh, we have, yeah, like three more minutes. So okay, sure. so uh, my, my grandmother was taken to Theresienstadt. Um, Theresienstadt was the, so to speak, the show camp of concentration camps where they took visitors from neutral countries. Uh, and it was relatively easy, relative is the word, in her transport, which was late in the war, 1200 something went, 200 and something came back. So those were easy conditions. Uh, my uncle uh, Walter ran away in 1933 when he read Mein Kampf. Ran to, he set up a business in Paris, a printing works. From there, when the Germans came, he fled to Vichy in the south. They was captured, but not sent to Auschwitz. My uncle uh, Ludwig uh, was married to a non-Jewish woman who stood by him. Um, well, anyway, there's Ludwig, yeah, with me. Uh, he became a forger. If, it's a long story about Ludwig. If there's time, we could go back to him. And my father was taken as a hostage. He was the members of the Jewish Community Council who were made to help the Gestapo round up the last Jews and were told if there's people that turn up in the morning, they would take they would be taken as hostages. And uh, some of those people, of course, just ran for their lives. So there were 20 uh, officials from the community council taken as hostages. My father was one of those. 
eight were shot, we know that, not my father. And he was sent to Auschwitz and presumably gassed straight away. So he never, he never came back. And, and Whereas, you only, well, you only found that, yeah, sorry, sorry, you only found out about it when you were something like 13 years old, 14 after the war, right? Yes, yes. When my grandmother came back, from Therese and she, she wrote it, she spoke English, so she could write to me. So from her, we heard what had happened. And how come if um, there were some, I mean, your uncles and your grandmother survived, how come you stayed, you, how come you didn't go back to live with them? It's a good question. And I always tell people, people ask it. And I would say it's really strange because until I was perhaps 60 years old, I never thought about it. So some sort of natural, and we, because I was the only offspring. Um, but quite recently, we found some old family letters, and it's obviously there was some sort of correspondence going on between the Foners and the Lishfordsits after the war, and it must have been decided just to leave me there, try to make me change language, culture, education, and so on again. Because I'm sure if my father had been alive, the story would have been different. Okay, thank you. It's uh, it's uh, we're right on time. Um, if um, so, I'm going to respect everybody's time and plans and and uh, round it up. I want to uh, thank you very very much for sharing the story with us. Um, for me, it's uh, always special to be able to be in such an occasion with you and hear the stories and I always hear uh, here and there new new angles and um, I actually wanted to ask you uh, about uh, how how the pictures of the refugees now from the Ukraine how that affected you if it had any kind of effect special effect on you as you were a refugee yourself so maybe we can uh, end with that well it does have an effect of course Oh, you know, the first thing that enters my head is, why isn't somebody making such a fuss about the refugees in, Ethio in Abyssinia, Ethiopia, mm. who also being persecuted? Um, that's, you know, close to where I served in the British Army when I was there. Um, yeah, it's a terrible thing. There's a huge number of refugees, huge. If, uh, the British or Americans had um, have you. had uh, any sense of taking in more of those refugees. It uh, would have been all to the United Kingdom's benefit because a lot of those children's kinder transport refugees became very eminent in their fields and added to the culture and the economy of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Okay, I had to rush into the other room and, uh, and give a hug <laughs> and to say thank you from all of us. And uh, thank you also, Ima, for being okay. always there. And thank you for joining us today. Um, Marty, thank you also for your, uh, your opening. You can always uh, contact Marty if you want to know any more details. Thank you to Mar and Alana for your support. And um, we'll see you next uh, time. Thank you all. Thank you so much.